Good afternoon. I'm Corey Shockey, and I have the privilege of leading the Foreign and Defense Policy Studies team at the American Enterprise Institute. It is my delight today to welcome you and put this event in the very capable hands of Eric Sayers, who AEI is delighted has joined our ball club. I know of no one who had greater influence on the debate over the INF Treaty and the way that a European focused treaty was actually now really impeding America's ability to carry out its defense obligations in the Pacific. Eric drove that conversation, changed my view on the treaty and I think many others. And so I'm very happy to hand you over to him. Thank you, Corey. Uh, it's, it's great to be at AEI now. I've, I've joined recently as a visiting fellow. Um, you know, we're, we're really here today to talk with, with Admiral Davidson, and um, we're going to talk about his Section 1251 report, which has been in the press a lot the last couple of days. Um, and we're also going to reflect on his time as, as a leader of the command, uh, Indo-Pacific Command, the last three years uh, as he departs in the next couple of months. So, Admiral, we're going to turn over to you for 15 minutes or so of, of remarks, and then you and I will have a bit of a conversation uh, back and forth, and then we'll turn it to the audience uh, and some questions that we have coming in to, to round out our discussion. So thanks, Admiral Davidson, for joining us from, from Hawaii today. Yes, thank you. Aloha, and uh, welcome to all uh, today. I appreciate the very warm welcome from Dr. Shockey and uh, Eric, it's, it's great to see you again. Thanks for all your help and support. I hope everyone's uh, families are in good health uh, and, and well, and, uh, are having vaccines available to you, um, in the weeks and months ahead. It's a pleasure to join you all today to discuss the Indo-Pacific region, what I believe to be the most critical region on the planet, certainly to the peace and prosperity of all those countries, you know, that reside in the region, but as well to the future prosperity of the United States. I'll keep my remarks around uh, 15 minutes or so to leave plenty of time for Eric and I to talk about some of the key issues and answer some of the questions that uh, those of you in the audience may be logging in with. And I very much look forward to our conversation today. Now, there are without doubt several major security challenges in the Indo-Pacific region, and I'm happy to discuss them with you. However, today during my remarks, I'll primarily focus my, premier, my prepared remarks on China. The most important thing I'd like you all to take away from the discussion is a fundamental understanding that the period between now and 2026, this decade, is the time horizon in which China is positioned to achieve overmatch in its capability and when Beijing could, could likely choose to forcibly change the status quo in the region. And I would say the change in that status quo um, could be permanent. Make no mistake about it, China seeks a new world order, one with Chinese characteristics, as they have often said, where Chinese national power is more important than international law. And that's something that they have made quite clear, both publicly and privately and repeatedly. And it's been reinforced through their diplomatic information, economic and military actions across the Indo-Pacific region. China has modernized its military more than any other nation on the planet during the course of this century. And as China continues to increase the size of the PLA, as well as advance their capabilities in a joint sense, the military balance in the Indo-Pacific is becoming more unfavorable for the United States and our allies. And with this imbalance, we are accumulating risk that may embolden China to unilaterally change the status quo before our forces might be able to deliver an effective response. Indeed, the greatest danger the United States and our allies face in this region is the erosion of conventional deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the People's Republic of China. Absent a convincing deterrent, China will be emboldened to take action to supplant the established rules-based international order and the values represented in our vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. The combination of China's military modernization program 
and its willingness to intimidate its neighbors through the use or threatened use of force undermines the peace, security, and prosperity in the region. In order to effectively deter China, we need to arm the joint force with the proper warfighting tools to support rapid force employment, accurate offensive power, and effective defenses. The US military, along with our allies and partners, must provide the combat credible deterrence to slow Beijing's decision-making and convince them that today is not the day. Now, deterrence is not something that you can necessarily measure. However, it is effective when a likely adversary chooses not to take a provocative action after calculating the consequences of what those actions might be. And deterrence is only effective if the adversary believes a combat credible opponent force exists. Deterrence is not a bluff. It is a demonstration of capacity, capability, and will that could deny China's objectives and to impose costs on their conventional military forces should competition turn to conflict. Ultimately, the steps we take in establishing an effective deterrent posture must convince Beijing unequivocally the costs of achieving their objectives by the use of military force are simply too high. Our joint forces in the Indo-Pacific must be postured to achieve a more advantageous security landscape without the use of military force. We must be doing everything possible to deter conflict. Our number one job out here is to keep the peace. But we absolutely must be prepared to fight and win should competition turn to conflict. As Eric mentioned at the beginning, to accomplish this, U.S. Indo-PACOM is pursuing a forward deployed deterrence in depth posture to defend the homeland, protect our values and interests globally, and defend our allies where we have mutual defense obligations. This requires a much more pervasive and persistent force posture and joint force laydown west of the international dateline. Properly positioned to defend in depth while possessing the capability to respond in competition, day to day, in crisis and in conflict in the region. Persistent presence through forward-based and rotational joint forces is the most credible way to demonstrate our commitment and our resolve to Beijing, while simultaneously assuring our allies and partners. It requires a deterrent posture that possesses the sustainment the force protection, the survivability to be resilient, as well as supportable. It takes a level of joint integration, not just service concepts, not just service platforms, but joint integration to deliver that deterrent posture and again, demonstrate the capability, the capacity, and the will. This brings me to Guam, our strategic heart in the Western Pacific, uh, Western Pacific excuse me, Guam is absolutely critical in maintaining deterrence and stability in the region. It's our most critical operating location west of the international dateline. Funding for the air and missile defense of Guam is my number one priority. Most importantly, because Guam is US homeland. Indeed, it's where America's day begins. There are 170,000 Americans living in Guam and their defense is homeland defense. DOD personnel comprise some 13% of the total population on Guam, a total of nearly 22,000 service members, civilians, contractors, family members that are supporting America's defense in Guam. That doesn't even include the rotational forces that move through there so frequently, ships, aircraft, and land forces. Guam is a critical nexus for command and control, for logistics and sustainment, and for our power projection as strategic deep water ports and airfields. We have billions of defense dollars and military capability in Guam today, and there are billions of dollars programmed by the United States to advance those capabilities tomorrow. 
The DOD continues to expand investments in warfighting capability and critical infrastructure there, rapidly increasing our overall footprint in Guam. For example, the Marine Corps Base Camp Blaze was established just this past November. It is the first new Marine Corps base established in the Pacific since 1952. And it will host some 5,000 Marines. We must evolve the critical defense of our people, our platforms, and our posture initiatives, and it begins in Guam. Now, a highly capable, fully adaptable, and proven system like Aegis, established in a fixed location like Guam, will deliver persistent 360 degree integrated air and missile defense from the second island chain. In addition to defending US citizens and American soil, this Guam defense system will also be capable of conducting the full spectrum of the detect to engage sequence, the sensing, the networking, and the, deliver the delivery of fires to support our maneuver. And that is indeed key to our joint force integration. It will be part of that network. The Guam defense system brings the same ability to protect Guam and the system itself as the three DDGs it would otherwise take to carry out the mission. DDGs, I'm sorry, destroyers, guided missile destroyers. We need to free up those guided missile destroyers who have multi-mission capability to detect threats and finish threats under the sea, on the sea, and above the sea so that they can move with the mobile and maneuverable naval forces that they were designed to protect and provide their ballistic missile defense. Finally, placing a fixed defense system on Guam does not make Guam a target. It is already one. China is making no secret of this fact, as evidenced in last fall's widely circulated PLA Air Force propaganda video, which explicitly depicted an attack on a mock-up of Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. In all, the Guam defense system will allow us to regain the advantage, help us deter China, and it will demonstrate our steadfast commitment to our allies and partners in the region that we are here to stay and to defend what is ours and to understand that that defense of that critical node is to help to facilitate the defense of our allies and interests abroad. So earlier this week, I submitted the Section 1251 Independent Assessment to Congress outlining Indo-PACOM's most pressing warfighting requirements to inform the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, or PDI as it's known. This is a congressionally mandated requirement. It's the law. And it's part of Section 1251 of the FY21 National Defense Authorization Act, which was passed in early January. The initiative was established by Congress to specifically to address joint requirements, the shortfalls associated with that, given the threats we face from great power competition. The assessment expands on my assessment from last year, which was titled Regain the Advantage, also mandated by law, and it was called the 1253 report then. This year, my 1251 assessment is broken down into five focus areas that establishes the necessary linkages between our strategy, our required capacity, our capabilities, and our priorities for the budget. First, we are focused on increasing joint force lethality. We continue to develop and field new technologies, the operational concepts and the capabilities necessary to deter aggression and prevail in any armed conflict. Our investments must harness the advanced capabilities provided by a network of leading edge technologies. Those capabilities are critical enablers to deter both day to day and in crisis. And if deterrence fails, key to our ability to fight and win. Second, we must enhance our design and posture in the region. We are developing a blueprint that enables capabilities in all domains and creates the virtue of mass without the vulnerabilities of concentration. This includes ensuring our Indo-Pacific posture provides a combat credible deterrent that protects free and open trade routes through the air, sea, land, space, and cyberspace. The third focus area 
is exercises, experimentation, and innovation. We are focused on improving our joint force readiness, especially given the high demand for interoperability and integrated fires in all domains. We are modernizing our exercise program to deliberately integrate experimentation and extensively exercise joint and combined command and control and our forces in order to counter any adversary. The fourth focus area is strengthening our allies and partners. We are increasing our interoperability, our information sharing, and our access with our allies and partners across the globe to enhance our capabilities and improve our coordination for competition. Our allies and partners must seek opportunities to increase our combined operations, exercises, and training across the globe as well. The final focus area in the 1251 is in logistics and security in English. Indo-PACOM requires a sophisticated balance of distribution capacity to sustain the joint force and provide that combat credible deterrent in a contested environment. The first and second island chains offer the capacity to support crisis and contingency operations, such as establishing dispersal locations, airfield repair capabilities, command and control nodes, munition storage, mo mobility uh, process, processing, excuse me, and fuel storage. Indeed, the 1251 assessment is designed to directly inform the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, specifically what is needed to enhance our deterrence strategy in the Indo-Pacific with a focus on strategic competition with China. I thank everyone for your attention here today. I look forward to the conversation and your questions. And uh, I'm really grateful for everyone's interest in the nation's national security and the security of our allies and partners in the region. Thank you for having me today. And with that, back to you, Eric. Great. Thanks, Admiral. Thanks for those very detailed uh, comments. I think we're just going to break out the screen here to you and I uh, and have a bit of a conversation. Um, and then, as I said, we're going to shift over to questions and answer. Uh, those who have questions can submit them. If you go to our uh, events page for this event on the AEI website, uh, you'll find an email for Allison Schwartz. You can email Allison or Allie, and she'll forward them along to me, and we can kind of keep this process moving forward fluidly. Um, sir, I want to talk about Section 1251. Uh, that's the issue of the day. That's probably why we have five or 600 RSVPs to this event. Um, we want to hear more more details from you on this, but I also want to mix in, you know, a few questions um, to you as we as you look back at your last three years at the command. You know, when when you did your your change of command now three years ago almost in May 2018. You know, on that day you, you took over the command, but the the command's name also changed. Uh, it was Pacific Command previously, despite the area of responsibility changing a number of times. Uh, and it was kind of updated and expanded to Indo-Pacific Command, of which it's been since, again, since that day in, in May 2018. I don't want to, you know, prescribe too much emphasis or importance to a name change, but, you know, three years later, as you look back, you know, how did that reflect a growing shift in the command's focus and emphasis? And how have you seen that play out these past three years as we think about not just the Pacific and Maritime Asia, but the Indo-Pacific? Oh, th uh, thank you for that, Eric. Yeah, no, I think it's been an incredibly uh, important change, um, not in the sense that it changed necessarily uh, uh, then PACOM's uh, responsibilities, and certainly it didn't change its geographic AOR, but it certainly resonated with the region, more accurately describes the responsibilities, as my predecessor used to say, and I have to give him credit for that, which uh, range from Hollywood to Bollywood and polar bears to penguins. Um, you know, that is the more accurate. And, you know, I think the timing was just right because it, it, it you know, recognizes the important contributions that South Asia is making more and more, uh, not only across the international community, but to the global potential prosperity um, that is growing in the region. Why do I think uh, Indo-Pacific is the most important region in, in the world and why I welcome the name change? In 10 years, two thirds of the world's population and two thirds of the global economy will be centered out here in the Indo-Pacific. Our, to me, that 
tells me that our future prosperity in America is going to be dependent on our ability to interact, act, and assess these um, markets uh, going forward. And then lastly, Great. Eric, I tell you, I, I can tell you, after the name change was announced, all my engagements across the region was welcomed by each and every one except China. For that reason yeah. alone, it was great marketing. Thanks. Great. Back to you, Eric. No, thanks. Well, I wanted to start with that, and then we'll get to PDI now um, and the Section 1250 run report. I think you correctly point out that, you know, as much as you've leaned in the last couple of years on these budget issues and, and what you think the command needs, you know, it's really Congress that's sort of led the way here in a bipartisan fashion, asking for this report, asking you specifically for what you need, but also asking OSD and the Pentagon what they believe they need. But to me, that represents a growing interest, a bipartisan interest, um, at the same time, a bit of a frustration with where we're going and what we need, you know, and, and I think it's great that, you know, this isn't just a, a one year report, but it's, it's over the next five years. So, you know, as we dig into this, I think it's, we should start with that. Um, some of the Biden administration officials who, who have testified recently, uh, Kath Hicks, who's now confirmed as the deputy secretary, Colin Call, who had his hearing this morning here before the Senate Armed Services Committee, they've given, they've talked about PDI and resourcing PDI. I take that as another good sign of the importance of uh, the need to have a debate about these investments. But, you know, let's dig in a bit more. You, you say PDI provides a pragmatic and kind of economically viable approach. Um, you know, I guess the question that many have are is how do we fit this in the base budget if it's likely to stay fat, flat? How can we afford this? You know, we still have priorities in the Middle East. Uh, Russia and UCOM are a priority. You know, what does the budget situation look like the next few years? And, and how can we afford, you know, what you're proposing here starting in FY22? Uh, thanks, Eric. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, not without uh, controversy, that's to be sure. Um, you know, the, the European Defense, or excuse me, Deterrence Initiative, which has had a couple of different names during the course of its, what, seven or eight years that it, it's been effective now, um, has been an essential and I think effective um, tool um, to help restore the deterrent posture uh, in Europe. The PDI as it's defined is still less than that amount alone. And it's, it's been fascinating to me, um, the relative ease at which the conversation happens year to year when it comes to EDI and, um, uh, and ERI um, when compared to PDI. Some of the, some of the angst has been mechanical, right? The, the original European initiative had access to the OCO money, and that made it an easier lift, you know, process-wise process -wise with the budget. The way the law is written, the PDI does not, you know, so that now, you know, fundamentally means it's got to come out of the top line unless extra funds were to be provided. That said, you know, I, I think there's been broad recognition uh, across uh, certainly the Congress um, and certainly the Department of Defense that what needs to be resourced are the critical enablers that, that provide for joint integration and what might provide for coalition integration as well. Um, you know, that doesn't really come out in service budgets, um, but we're finding that, you know, the power of the joint force, and it is indeed a joint fight out here, you know, is what presents the actual, you know, deterrent posture that could be effective. And um, so we focus our advocacy on that joint integration piece. And that, and frankly, that's where, you know, Guam comes in. I'm personally, you know, very, very encouraged by the individual services approach um, in their own budget development of some of their individual service documents, but it's all gotta be knitted together. And it's all, and you've gotta find the areas in which um, uh, stovepipes get knocked down and it becomes a more seamless structure because that's what it's going to take. And there are opportunities there in sensing, in multi-domains, multi-services, <laughs> in networking, multi-domains, multi-services, and in the fires that are required to bring all that together. Importantly, I think PDI needs to get after the here and now. So uh, the threat as we, as I discussed in my remarks over the course of this decade is the critical time in which we've got to you know, get after the resources that are necessary for this. Lastly, I would submit, you know, that the, the cap um, that Congress has put on it at $5.5 billion um, for this coming year. So this last year, the number was less than half of that. 
um, uh, for this coming year, you know, that, that's less than seven tenths of 1% of the DOD budget um, as it stands. You know, so we took, you know, uh, an approach that concentrated on the investments that were absolutely needed out here, you know, from a joint integration perspective. Back to you. No, that's perfect. You anticipated most of my questions as part of this. I, you know, I guess my only other one would be what's been the congressional reaction. You know, we've seen um, the chairs and rankings of, of the armed services committees support this in various ways. I know you've been up there to brief them. You know, this is going to take a partnership, you know, so it was stimulated by Congress, but it's, it's also going to have to move forward with OSD and congressional part of, uh, partnership. So you know, what's the message you're getting up there as you go to the Hill and as you talk to staff? Well, it's, I mean, I, I was very encouraged last year by the congressional leadership's co-authoring in May of last year, an article talking about how important this was. And, um, you know, I'm encouraged so far um, by some of the initial investments I'm seeing in the 22. And again, the 22 budget is under review um, by the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that she articulated that PDI has got to be one of the priorities that are uh, addressed in that. So, you know, it's a good conversation. Um, you have to pull up from the aegis and concentrate on the force of the whole. I mean, there's no doubt ab uh, about, you know, what my priorities are. I I've, I've made that clear. I described them to you here today and we'll, we'll continue to advocate for that. Back to you. On, on those priorities, um, I want to give you a, a check, a second to go further on, on the Guam piece. You know, this is the, as you said, your top priority. It's also perhaps where there's the most uh, disagreement, but healthy disagreement. I'm, I'm glad there's a debate. There should be a debate. Um, you know, but I'm, I want you to speak a bit more to, you know, why, why this specific mission at Guam uh, and why the capability that you're recommending? You know, you, you did mention the DDGs and the requirement, you know, for at least three, if not nine rotating from Hawaii to, to meet that mission. Um, but can you go a little bit further into the Guam piece uh, and, and why that's so critical as part of your investments uh, for the next couple of years? Yeah, the, you know, the thing that is so important, um, kind of twofold, one, it's re return on investment, right? Um, for the cost it takes to build that facility and flesh it out, I free up at least three ships in conflict and probably more ships in crisis, um, you know, in the deterrence phase to keep up a rotation and do all that kind of stuff going forward. You know, secondly, you know, what's there in Guam right now is a bad uh, radar. And then we have a destroyer um, on a a potential response timeline, given what we think the threats are. But it doesn't provide for a 360 degree defense necessarily, right? It's, it's really designed to defend against a rogue shot from North Korea. So, you know, my advocacy for capabilities that are on the shelf now and effective on the ground in Europe, <laughs> being purchased by our allies at sea. I mean, you just saw the USS John Finn, you know, intercept a, 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 an ICBM and a test here just in the last few months you know, demonstrates to you that this is kind of the gateway to the future and what the future threats might bring. The other return on investment is it, it has to meet the timeline. And uh, the threat as it's manifest in this decade is critically important. And what the Chinese are showing you, not only in video, but in deployments in the region with circumnavigations of Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas with service ships, with, you know, uh, bomber runs in the Philippine Sea with submarines doing uh, circumnavigations around those areas. It means there's a 360 degree threat from cruise missiles, you know, from anti ship ballistic missiles in the future, and certainly from the ballistic missile um, inventory in China alone. So that's, you know, that, that's kind of the, the first piece. The second piece um, that is, uh, you know, so critical to me is its viability um, and signaling to the region that America is here to stay and that we are part of the broader network, knowing the importance of Guam and many of the dialogues that I have with allies and partners across the region, they understand the geostrategic nature of that location, why it's been US territory now for you know, 70 plus years, and how important that is. Um, that posture, that assurance of our allies and partners that we're here to stay, and the deterrence capability, you know, that signals we're not gonna 
let Blanc go without a fight <laughs> um, is critically important. At the end of the day, Guam can, it, it is not a de facto status that we only need to be able to fight from it. We're going to have to be able to fight for it. And missile defense uh, in the region is critical. And, and our allies and partners who are increasing their investments in their defense in the region, you know, recognize the same thing for their territories. Back to you. That's great. Um, we talked a bit about the defensive side. I maybe have two more questions before we get to the audience. Let's shift over to the offensive side. Um, you know, as Corey mentioned at the top, you know, we're now in a post-INF world. Um, your report talks about uh, aggregate offensive power, uh, the need for long-range fires, at a, and the difference between last year and this year, I noticed, was that you talked about at a range beyond 500 kilometers. Um, can you speak a bit more about how you see the role uh, of, of ground-based fires beyond 500 kilometers? What sort of capabilities, capability mix we might need from the, you know, from the Army and the Marine Corps? Um, and also what, what the Paul Mill challenge looks like you know, to be able to exploit that maneuver opportunity. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're only forward and have access um, beyond Guam and, and a couple of other locations, U.S. territories, if our allies are, are willing to, to, to enable us. Uh, so can you speak to the, the offensive side and specifically the ground-based fires? Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. I see, you know, again, I'm, I'm encouraged by the, the Marine Corps and Army approach uh, and what was budgeted last year in the near term. Uh, because it gets after capabilities that are available to them now um, uh, to provide later. And, you know, the Tomahawk, SM-6, you know, starts that conversation. I'm also encouraged by, you know, the Navy and um, uh, Air Force investments there. You know, it is cr critically important that um, some of our uh, approach when it comes to power projection, um, you know, needs to recognize that we have to achieve you know, sea control and air control and all that kind of stuff. So our investments in these fires are critically, critically important. Um, Guam provides, and in fact, the Guam defense system that I articulated, which, you know, is built essentially on our history of Aegis in our destroyer and cruiser force. Um, it, you know, we've long integrated offensive capabilities into that with Tomahawk and, you know, the potential uh, now with SM6. So, you know, that's a key opportunity there as well. Not to mention the battle management that comes with it and the, the command and control connectivity and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm very encouraged by that. I'm also encouraged by the service um, uh, approaches, both both the MDTF from the Army and uh, General Berger's um, uh approach with uh, with the uh, LMRs, the, the, the littoral uh, marine regiments. I, I think those are, you know, great concepts that uh, give us opportunity, you know, to define, you know, how to, that joint networking, how that's going to come together, work on the fires process uh, to make it occur, go forward, and actually have those things be useful to us uh, in time. You know, discussions of long-range capability, I could tell you independently, you know, a lot of our allies and partners are having that discussion internal to their own uh, countries and portfolios, given the threat that has been manifest from China. Um, there would be, you know, policy interaction that would have to take place to do these things going forward. But as I'm frequently reminded, you know, the fault line in the international order is the first island chain. And uh, the countries that reside in the first island chain, you know, recognize that, I think, more than anyone else uh, on the planet. And, and we should recognize it as well. Back to you. Well, that brings up another important point. Um, there's a quote from Alfred Thermahan about how portions of the Earth's surface uh, and their consequent interests differ from time to time. It's really talking about critical geography. You, we've talked about Guam, we've talked about the first island chain. You know, but in your time, though, in the last three years, I think there's been a number of other places whose, you know, whose, whose consequent interest has, has been raised, uh, and specifically the Pacific Islands, and Oceania. You know, this is a, there's a number of questions that have come in on this for later. It's a place that you spent time and a region you spent time traveling to. Uh, there's a bit of a crisis right now with the, with the PIF, Pacific Island Forum. Um, you know, these are areas that five or 10 years ago, I don't think your, your predecessors were thinking about, but you've had to spend a lot more time and energy on. So could you speak to Oceania and the Pacific Islands? Yeah, you know, critical uh, to your earlier quote uh, of Mahan, you know, critical geostrategic ground. You know, for other 
um, you know, for an army commander, it's high ground, right? And, and that's the way I think about, you know, the three freely associated states with the United States, especially, but the whole of the Pacific Island chain. Um, additionally, I'm responsible not only for the defense of our U.S. territories out there, Guam, Guam, CNMI, and you know, half a dozen others, um, but also the freely associated states of Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And, um, you know, these are you know, millions of square miles of ocean space with pretty small populations that I think are, uh, you know, historically, I not think, you know, we should all know they are historically, you know, ground that had to be fought for during World War II. I see a staggering amount of PRC attempts at corruption, coercion, and co-option in the theater. And it, it, across the whole of the Pacific Island chain, and it involves, you know, under the table payments of government and business elites. It involves, you know, direct coercive action about, you know, you'll do one thing. And uh, if you do that one thing, or you cease doing one thing, for example, if you call on the UN to investigate the source of the Wuhan virus, then you know we China will punish you. I think there's a there's a wonderful example of that. This just in the past week or so, um, the PRC did not like something the Taiwan foreign minister had to say uh, in the public space and stopped all pineapple imports into China. I I, I think I, I'm not making that point to be. To, to make light of it, I'm making the point to, to talk about, you know, how dramatic that is. 91% of Taiwan's pineapple exports go to China. So the coercive nature of what you'll say or what you won't say and how China will respond is part of it. And then they're trying to co-opt, you know, leadership and in international institutions that matter. Um, and, you know, things like telecommunications, highly prized, highly needed across the Pacific Island chain. Air travel, <laughs> you know, highly prized. Agriculture, something that all those Pacific Island chain nations um, have a high need for. Um, for China to assume leadership of those at the UN and dictate the norms uh, through it, I think is, is uh, high danger. So we need to be focused on the Pacific Island chain and, and its importance to us, not only militarily, you know, the high ground I talked about at the beginning, uh, but their role in international institutions and as part of this global economy that's so important to us. Um, and I think we need to we need to sustain that focus on the Pacific Island chain going forward. Back to you. Great. Yeah, and perhaps buy a few more pineapples in the week ahead. Um, on that topic, on Taiwan, uh, another area that, you know, those commanders before you have had to think about or perhaps not invest as much time as you have, uh, just like the Pacific Islands. Um, you know, how do you view the overall situation across the strait, especially from a military perspective? Uh, is it tense but stable? Is it deteriorating? How do you view the PLA's military objectives there in the near term? Um, you know, and how can we best ensure Beijing does not conclude the military situation favors them and there may be, an, you know, an opening or a military opportunity in the, in the years ahead? Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Eric. Um, certainly in the military space alone, in and around Taiwan over the last uh, several months, we've seen an uptick in uh, air activity from the PRC. Uh, it includes bomber flights, uh, fighter flights, um, uh, reconnaissance aircraft, maritime patrol aircraft, uh, even going so far as to repeatedly uh, penetrate the, um, the Taiwan Air Defense Identification Zone, or ADIS, as we know it in the military. Um, We've seen, you know, around the Senkakus, a lot of Chinese Coast Guard and, and uh, fishing vessel uh, penetrations uh, around there as well. Um, you know, these, these activities are part of the fabric of the region. Um, you know, when you think about the future and where this might be headed, um, I articulated during my comments here that I'm deeply concerned about the next six years, but certainly the course of uh, this decade as well. You know, given the changes 
um, in capacity, right? The numbers of, of fighters, bombers, ships, uh, as well as the capability change there when it comes to the PRC. Um, when I look back at the turn of the century here, um, Taiwan exceeded China's capability and capacity numbers. That is no longer the case. So um, helping to encourage uh, Taiwan uh, on their investments, um, a mix of capabilities that include capabilities that helps Taiwan deter, as well as provides some asymmetric capabilities that helps Taiwan defend, um, I think are, is, is a very important um, you know, approach that um, the department needs to take. Uh, and I would say, you know, for the greater U.S. government, that consistent arms sales uh, to Taiwan to help in this deterrent strategy is critically important. And again, that takes a balance of capabilities to go to them. Back to you. And can I just follow up on, you know, there's there's been a bit of a shift the last few years on the you know, on our engagement. Uh, we've always focused on arms sales, but there's been a bit more of an emphasis on the potential for training the potential for engagement. You know, you have a bit of an informal relationship in your command with, with your, you know, the ROC military. Um, they can come to the command, but not in uniform. Uh, there's been reports that, you know, some of your, your uh, jaders have been able to travel to, to Taiwan in, in, the, in the past year. You know, on these other elements of the relationship, especially training and kind of military to military engagement, do you think we're in a good spot there? Is there room for, for growth and improvement? Um, uh, just like you to expand a bit more on that, and then we'll move on. Yeah, it's, you know, certainly our engagements, and, and you described it um, fairly accurately, is you know help to de to design to enable Taiwan to maintain a sufficient self defense and deterrent capability, um, having an understanding of their of both those things, capacity and capability, how they intend to fight um, if they were called upon. You know, we have to have that understanding in order to fulfill, you know, the fight and win rubric, um, you know, that, that's part of every, you know, combat commander's uh, portfolio. But more importantly, having the understanding and providing the assistance that helps them deter, I think, on a day-to-day -day basis is, is uh, critically important. And, um, you know, the activities that we've undertaken uh, so far are designed, you know, expressly for that. Back to you. I just want to do one more. Um, it's important, but I don't think it's one that gets a lot of attention. But it's on, you know, one of the pieces that's that's in your report and the twelve fifty one report is is on the training side. Uh, this this idea for for PIMTech, uh, the Pacific Multi Domain Test and Experimentation Capability. You call this, you know, potentially the largest coalition range complex globally. Includes, you know, CONUS, uh, OCONUS, potentially in the region. You know, what does that mean for warfighting readiness, you know, in the next five or 10 years, if you can, you can uh, fully see this, this idea materialize? Yeah, it comes back to the joint force integration that I think is uh, all the COCOM's obligation out here, right? You know, the more advanced capability sets that, you know, we've hoped for for so long, fifth gen fighters, you know, integrated air and missile defense, you know, long range fires, sensing and multi-domains and the connectivity in that and how that can help facilitate maneuver and fires. You know, it's critically important. We're starting to see it come to the region, right? Not only the United States, but Japan, Korea, Australia, they're getting F-35s. They've been buying Aegis. They're investing in ballistic missile defense. Out here in the Indo-Pacific, we have an extraordinary range structure from the Jay Park in Alaska to, you know, what we have at Fallon, Nevada and at Nellis, you know, along the Southern California coast. Very importantly, here in Hawaii, the only brigade size live fire um, training range over on the Big Island. And of course, the extraordinary missile defense undersea, on the sea training range that is in Kauai, as well as what we're building out in Guam. And then I would say Australia and Japan have investments here too. And these things have been developed by either the test and development community by individual services, or you know, partially to generate individual service training readiness um, over time. And now that we're generating, you, you know, multi-service integrated air and missile defense capabilities and multi-service fifth gen fighters, we gotta, we gotta stress those things. So our blue forces need to be able to be properly exercised in them. We, across the whole of the joint force, don't have enough 
adversary aircraft is just one example. To put all the adversary aircraft up that would truly stress F-35s and F-22s and advanced attackers and all that stuff. So we need to come to a live virtual constructive construct for that. You know, be able to stress the joint force, train it, and allow us to bring in the capabilities that I described, fifth gen and so on, and future capabilities to come, even up to the staff and stone level, to help us deter. What does that mean? You, you know, reveal the capabilities that we want to reveal and conceal the capabilities we want to conceal. And then lastly, bring in the multi-domain, right? Cyber fires, space domain interaction, the sensing and all that kind of stuff. That has to come to the joint force now. Um, we've worked with um, one of the FFAs to come up with a concept for how to do it very efficiently. Um, I got some pretty good traction on, on this effort, I think, in the building, and we'll continue to flesh it out going forward. Back to you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, you know, we're going to transition over to questions, which means you're still going to have me, sir, just reading off some of the questions from our audience uh, in this virtual events world we're in. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to kind of get to, I guess, our inboxes have kind of filled up, as you would expect, with questions. I've tried to rack and stack some of them from the last few days uh, and, and sort of build on some of my our earlier conversation. I'm going to start, you know, we started with Indo-Pacific and the Indian Ocean. I'm going to start with a question from Dimitri Sevastopoulou at uh, the Financial Times. Uh, I think, Dimitri, you had a good question um, about how maritime cooperation with India has evolved. And do you expect India to become even more active at sea, given the growing tensions and, and recent clashes along, you know, border issue, along the border with China? Um, and it's probably even more relevant in, in the context of the Quad and, and finally in, inviting um, Australia back into the Malabar exercise. But let's start with India and kind of their exercises and where you see that going. Uh, I, I think India is the strategic opportunity for the United States going forward, and not only in the military sphere, but you know certainly across the whole of you know the government to government interaction that uh, could take place there. Its potential in the in a quad format <clears throat> is, I, I think, also you know extremely uh, influential across the whole of the Indo-Pacific, and I would submit across the globe. It, it's a diamond of democracies. You know, willing to work together in um, in diplomacy, economics, and things like that—really remarkable potential. Um, our relationship with India has advanced markedly in the last three years, and um, uh, you know, to me, it, it comes from three things. One is uh, information sharing. We've advanced that uh, deeply. Um, it's it's affected, you know, kind of. Um, the kind of things that we can do together, not only in the Indian Ocean, but actually in the entirety of the Indo-Pacific as well. And it's led to initiatives to um, potentially create some liaison officers and things like that, other things that we're in discussion about there. The second thing is, you know, some demonstrated interoperability, and I have to give the, uh, the P8 um, commonality between the United States, India, and Australia, you know, credit here. Um, you know, some, some like operations um, and mutual support of each other, I, I think, opened the, not only um, India's eyes, but our eyes into the potential collaboration that's possible there. It also, you know, paved the way to some deeper liaison uh, going forward. And then the last discussion is, is, is uh, you know, some of the discussion about access. You know, we're deepening in all the services. But, you know, there's the joint exercises you know, that we sponsor, but each of the components out here have individual service resource exercises out there. You know, that's deepening the relationships uh, with India as well. So I, I'm very pleased to see that move forward. I'm very, in a bilateral nature, absolutely. And, you know, the whole concept of the quad also. Yeah, let's, let's stay on the quad. I, I've got a number of questions on that. You said India is an opportunity. I think the quad's an opportunity as well. Um, always moving as, qu as quick as, whoever the slow, slowest member is at the time. Um, but in recent years, you know, we, we've seen some real energy there. And I think the, the Biden administration in its first couple months here wants to sort of pick that up and carry it forward and maybe even expand it. So it's not just uh, military issues. And of course, it, it began, you know, in earnest and after the Southeast Asian tsunami in 2004, uh, focused on humanitarian response. How do you see the, the quad kind of emerging and, and what's the opportunity from, from where you sit at Indo-PACOM to kind of seize that opportunity? 
Yeah, well, it's, I talked about it a little bit at the beginning here. I, you know, I, it, it, it needs to be uh, have a much wider um, area of conversation than than just security. I think that misses the opportunity there, right? Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, uh, two thirds of the global population and two thirds of the global economy will be centered in, in the Western Pacific. It will certainly include all of South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, China, Japan, us um, going forward. Um, I, uh, you know, I was very encouraged by the, by the ministerial calls that have occurred uh, so far. And I, I'd be getting out in front of the administration. Uh, you know, they'll be, I think, defining the way ahead for, for the quad and all the opportunity that it represents. But I've been encouraged by the conversation across the interagency so far. Great. I want to pivot to Japan, U.S.-Japan alliance. There's a question uh, from Rio Tadai at the GG Press in Japan. Uh, you know, what's your take on the Japanese government's decision to acquire counterattack capabilities? Uh, in terms of the strength of the U.S.-Japan alliance capability, do you think it's a good idea for Japan to invest in these, these systems uh, instead of using you know, limited resource to bolster, bolster defensive capability? So overall, how do, what do you think about you know, this emerging investment in, in this mission from, from Tokyo? Yeah, I, I won't comment on the, in, in, uh, on the investment itself. I'm, and I, the counterattack term, I, I, I don't know everything that that involves. Um, without question, though, I think all of our allies and indeed partners in the region are looking at the changes in the geostrategic you know, construct out there, the vast changes in China's approach to the region, whether it's you know, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, the line of actual control, the South China Sea, the Sinkakus, Taiwan, it goes on and on and on, um, Tibet, Nepal, but also the capability and capacity changes that are occurring there. Um, uh, so, you, you know, when I, when I'm interacting with my counterparts, they're focused on, you know, the, the needs that they take, that they need to take aboard budget changes, um, capability changes that help them compete, manage in crisis, and then potentially win, um, if they were forced into conflict. Um, I, I, and I say every ally and partner in the region is undertaking that effort. Back to you. Yeah, sorry, by, by counterattack, I, I meant strike capabilities. The, the Japanese have talked about NSM and El Razm and Tomahawk, I believe, as, as part of that solution. So that's, I was really referring to strike. Um, happy to kind of move, move forward, though. I, I don't know if you had the chance to, to catch the 60 Minutes segment the other night on the Iran strike a year ago, Al Assad, but you know, that really brought home the vulnerability of shore facilities and air bases to conventional ballistic missiles. Um, we've talked a little bit about Guam. Um, clearly that was, you know, a much more limited strike from, from Iran and, and not others, but, you know, in, in lieu of that and a large inventory of, of weapons that the, the PLA rocket force has and ballistic end crews, how does that inform, you know, your future requirements for operations and support in the Western Pacific? That's a question here we're getting. I think you've talked about it a little bit so far, but I wanted to give you a chance to maybe expand on it a little bit further as we talk about the balance between, you know, fixed sites and and, and, and maritime maneuver. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the context uh, from whoever the asker was. You know, it's, it's very important in these conversations that, you know, we don't be deterred ourselves. Um, the alternative to not providing adequate defense <laughs> is to, to let adversaries take this round with a single shot or without firing a shot, that is the opposite of imposing cost, which, you know, there's always an element of imposing cost on it, you know, and oh, by the way, you know, we're trying to clearly communicate to the adversary that their efforts will, cannot be achieved cheaply. You know, you would have to put more into it to do it. There's always been an evolution of fires. Secondly, you have to have some offensive capability that convinces the adversary not to undertake this. If you look back on the you know, 70 years of their strategic deterrent in the United States, all of that capability is vulnerable to all that capability on the other side. But it has been the nature of deterrence, the addition of missile defense, that has assured its viability going forward. 
So, you know, we, let's be clear about what we're talking about here. Everything on the planet um, that, you know, wears a uniform has some kind of vulnerability somewhere. You've got to work to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Some of that is investment. Some of that is tactics, techniques, and procedures. Some of that is the, the, the mutual combination of, of uh, both those things and others. And you got to have that in order to deter, which is the point here. Back to you. That's great. Um, another question we had was on, on exercises. And, and this brings us back to the 1251 report. Uh, could you give some more details on, on how you see the exercise program evolving specifically into your Pacific Resolve exercise? You know, what will this look like uh, over the next five years? And what's the benchmark of, of an integrated coalition uh, that Pacific Resolve seeks to achieve? I'm not sure what you're talking about when you say Pacific Resolve. Pacific Resolve, uh, the, the exercise... Um, that's you know part of your joint exercise program. Oh, Defender Pacific. 1251. Okay, all right. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean I think uh, you know I, I talk about a rotational and permanent force presence with the kind of capabilities that they need moving through the theaters helps us to to deter. Yeah, um, you know the advantages that um, those rotational exercises bring us, where they where we can disaggregate some forces, you know run exercises from multiple locations um, or concentrate uh, forces and run uh, like a large exercise like Cobra Gold or something like that, you know, helps us knit together that allied and partner network, develop the kind of interoperability that we need to do, um, stresses our logistics and sustainment networks, our, our access um, uh, needs and things like that. And, you know, that has to continuously evolve. Um, and it has to be, um, you know, bringing in by, by continuously evolving, you know, it has to be bringing in the capabilities that our allies and partners and, and we are, are starting to bring to the force uh, going forward. And, um, you know, so that means taking a careful look at all our exercises. And I've asked my components to do the same with those service resource exercises to see where the opportunity exists to take advantage of the monies that we have and exercise in the manner that I, I just described, you know, trying to achieve the outputs that I just described. Back to you. Just a few final in the, in the last 10 minutes here. Um, there was one from, from Tony Capaccio at Bloomberg on, you know, the status of the D21 D, uh, and, and is it fully fielded and integrated and is it being tested? Uh, maybe you could talk a bit about that specific capability to the degree you can in this environment. Um, and then, you know, the broader kind of PLA investment portfolio and, and We've talked a lot about what we're doing and what we should be doing, but you know what what sort of keeps you up at night as part of uh, the PLA's capability. But maybe start with the DF twenty one to Tony's question. I'll, I'll speak more generally than that, Eric. You know, given the unclassified nature, you know, certainly we're seeing um, China continue to test and develop um, their capabilities. Those include uh, ballistic missiles um, uh, in all ranges, uh, as well as um, the potential for ballistic missile, um, you know, capability to develop anti-ship ballistic missiles, um, what that might bring from, from their seaborne uh, assets like the Renai cruiser as well. Um, one of the things that I've been advocating for that I think are so critical uh, when it comes to posture and the whole discussion of uh, posture in the region is making sure that we have, you know, the correct uh, intelligence support to understand uh, uh, deeply the developments in uh, the Chinese uh, portfolio, not only in ballistic missiles, uh, but across the whole of their joint force uh, going forward. Um, we continue to try to keep a close eye on that and um, watch very carefully the messaging that China is trying to associate that and how China is using it to try to intimidate uh, their neighbors and our allies and partners. Back to you. Yeah, thanks for that. I think we found a lot of, uh, of allies on the Hill who think that the intelligence community needs to be investing, you know, more in the in the China threat. Certainly, a topic that came up a lot during testimony recently for DNI and CIA director nominees. Um, maybe we could just just pivot topics here. We talked a lot about the high end, um, the comp, you know, competition here, but we haven't talked as much about the gray zone and the South China Sea. Um, that's, that's kind of interesting. A couple of years ago, it was all South China Sea. 
probably shows how much this conversation is evolving and how much the threat has grown. But maybe we can just talk a few minutes and, and not overlook the, the South China Sea and kind of the gray zone competition. Yeah, we've seen a number of activities uh, from China during the, the course of the you know, last couple of years and certainly in the COVID environment uh, that continues to be um, really assertive and uh, even aggressive in the region. Um, they're still trying to dictate the norms um, of how South China Sea claimants, those on the rim of the South China Sea, uh, might conduct themselves or conduct themselves with others through the code of conduct negotiation. Um, you know, the kind of aggressive actions you're also seeing involve, you know, ramming a Vietnamese vessel, you know, harassing Malaysian exploration ships of West Capella from a few months ago uh, in the Malaysian EEZ, um, live fire events, uh, the deployment of fighters, uh, maritime patrol aircraft, um, early warning aircraft out to the uh, militarized features in the South China Sea, deployments and exercises with bombers, ships, submarines, things like that. Um, they go on. Uh, the interactions with the United States activities in the South China Sea um, are almost universally you know, safe and professional. In fact, I, I would say since September of 18, you haven't seen the kind of behaviors uh, that we saw uh, with that interaction with the, uh, the Decatur um, back, uh, back almost three years ago now. Um, but it is alarming and concerning to all the South China Sea clan nations. One of the efforts that we have deliberately undertaken is to make sure that the international community understands that it's not a US-China issue in the South China Sea. It is the freedom of communication issue um, for the international community through that water. And um, it's, it's not only about ships passing in the night, it's the aircraft that fly over it. It's the trillions of dollars of financial information that runs through telecommunications cables on the bottom of the sea. And what that freedom of communication actually delivers. I would submit it's the connective tissue that binds the region uh, together. And it extends out from the South China Sea as well. So we've seen uh, um, Japan, the UK, France, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, India, you know, all other Philippines, all undertake uh, Vietnam, all undertake operations uh, in the South China Sea together in some instances, including exercises, independently and others in multi-nation forums and all that kind of stuff. And I've been very encouraged by the international communities. Um, commitment to freedom of communication and their presence in the South China Sea. Back to you. And is it fair? It's fair to say, uh, you tell me, if if kind of our our, our tempo of, of maritime presence in the Fawn Ops program and, and other transits in the Western Pacific, that seems to have continued unabated the last few months. You know, our, we go through this natural process of an election cycle and a transition and, you know, an inauguration and nomination process. But, you know, you, you've been there through that whole thing, and it doesn't look like our tempo has been altered or changed it much at all. Yeah, we've enjoyed uh, you know steady support across uh, two administrations now um, for these activities. Understand, um, you know, I, certainly there's advocacy from this headquarters about its importance and what it means to freedom of communication and the example that it actually sets in the region. Back to you. Great. And I'll just, you know, finish up with these last two and I'll maybe rapid fire. Um, there was one on the U.S., the role of the U.S. Coast Guard and its presence in the Pacific and, and how, you know, you can utilize that. And then on um, military sea lift, the combat logistics force, um, another area where uh, logistics, and that's an area of your 1270, you know, your 1251 report as well that you focus on. But, you know, what does maritime logistics look like for you in a, in a very contested environment going forward? So Coast Guard presence and, and combat logistics fleet. Um, thanks for that, Eric. Um, yeah, I, I speak uh, quite frequently with uh, my counterpart here in the Pacific, uh, Vice Admiral Fagan, um, uh, about um, activities and operations and potential out here in the region. And I, I saw the Commandant uh, uh, Admiral um, Schultz uh, last week alone. Uh, I'm very encouraged. And, you know, the Coast Guard 
um, capability and presence here, not only in the Pacific Island, but in the Western Pacific, critically important. They have law enforcement relationships, um, even with you know the PRC, um, that are critical to us, the us meaning the international community, understanding the network of activities of illicit activities that can occur in the sea space, right? Human trafficking, narco trafficking, IUU fishing, you know, the whole shooting match. So the, uh, the Coast Guard is an important partner. They occasionally, you know, and it's more on the rare occasion, operate under um, uh, our, our take on out here, uh, but they have their own, um, you know, deployments out here under uh, Coast Guard authorities. Uh, in the region, and the, they're highly, highly prized. And the level of interaction that they have with uh, not to, uh, with a lot of those nations in the Pacific Island chain that only have law enforcement organizations as opposed to defense organizations is very, very important. And I, I felt um, well supported, and um, uh, had, have had a really transparent dialogue with the Coast Guard. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to see them back here. People don't always understand that uh, during the recapitalization phase of the Coast Guard um, over the last oh, decade and a half or so, a lot of the Coast Guard presence in the Pacific came out. They were concentrating their effort on the Caribbean and, and uh, Southcom for um, the, the narco trafficking effort <coughs> and the interdiction effort that was uh, down there. Now that a lot of the force has been recapitalized, you know, it's, it's um, been made available out here and it's very, very important. Um, secondly, to your question about uh, contested logistics, yeah, this is something that the organization uh, spends a lot of time on each and every day. So we're plugged in with an effort uh, going on back in uh, back in the Pentagon, um, and you know certainly um, my organization understands uh, that a lot of the efficiencies that were driven into the total logistics environment, of which I would say that the the, the military sea lift component is one, you know, had a business efficiency focus and not necessarily a warfighter focus. So, you know, helping Transcom kind of understand what the requirements are, um, understanding, you know, how we're going to operate in that congested logistics environment and what the needs are going forward is part of a very robust uh, conversation, you know, coming out of this headquarters. Um, I mentioned uh, sustainment as, uh, and logistics, you know, critical need in Guam. It's got to get there. And it's got to be able to get from Guam and, you know, frankly, from Pearl and from across the Indo-Pacific region, you know, to the point of need uh, in these warfighting concepts. So we're very involved with those kind of uh, conversations and how that needs to advance going forward. Back to you. Great. Uh, no, thanks, sir. Um, we're about 70 minutes. It's a great place to wrap it up. You've been very generous with your time. Um, please bring us some good weather next week when you come for a congressional testimony. Uh, we finally broken the spell here in Washington, but no, we really engage you. We, we really appreciate you engaging in the, the public debate and taking our questions uh, here in Washington uh, and appreciate your, your, your leadership out there the last three years. So thanks again for joining me and joining AEI for this discussion. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the time today. Dr. Shockey, appreciate it as well. And uh, once again, to all of you out there participating, thanks for your interest in our nation's security. Um, it's, it's a dialogue that's becoming more and more important here over time. And I think we'll be on the front of everyone's windshield here uh, during the course of this decade. Thanks so much, everyone. Out here. Thanks, sir.